I remember when I was younger, there was a friend of mine who lived in a really, really big house, three-story house. And I would go over to his house all the time to play, but we would always have to play outside. And I remember looking at his house and thinking to myself, man, I would really love to go in there and, and see the inside of this house. Well, one day, as we're outside playing, his mother came and asked if we wanted to come in for lunch. And I got super excited. I was finally going to go in and see this house. And as we're walking in, his mother says to us, you boys come on in, but just don't touch anything. You see, his mother had everything in that house exactly how she wanted it. It was spotless. Everything had a place. The floor was immaculate. The carpet was clean. Everything was just, well, it was nice. She didn't want us to come in there and move anything around and, in essence, throw her life completely out of order. But you know, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes we're that way about the Lord. In Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. And then in John 14, verse 23, Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. I want you to understand that in a very real sense, Jesus wants inside of your life. Jesus wants to be a part of your home. He wants to be a part of your life. And I hear statements from people all the time. You'll hear friends, you'll hear family, you'll even hear people on television say things like, accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior. Invite Jesus into your life. And you hear all kinds of people saying that. And they will say yes. I want Jesus in my life. Yes, Lord, I want you in my house. Just don't touch anything. Don't touch anything. Because you see, I kind of have my life, my life's in order right now. I kind of have my house arranged exactly how I like it. I'm living my life exactly the way I want to live it. Now you can come in, Lord, by all means, come on in. I don't mind you being here, but just don't touch anything. You know how silly that is. How silly it is for us to think that God would send his son from heaven to die for the sins in our lives and to call for us to have a relationship with him and to expect that we're not going to allow him to change anything. Is that really what you think Jesus is all about? Jesus said that he was coming to help us straighten out our lives. Listen, Jesus did not come to make your life easier. Jesus did not come to make your life easier or to allow you to live like how you want to live. He came to save your soul and to teach you a way of living to where you can live with him forever in eternity. You see, the message of Jesus Christ is a life-changing message. In Luke chapter 24, verse 32, as those two men on the road to Emmaus was walking with Jesus, they asked the question. They said, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? The words of Jesus are life-changing, and they are a life-moving message. In Acts chapter 2, verse 37, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They were cut to the heart, and then they said, what do we need to do? They asked, what do we need to change in our life? How do I need to rearrange my life? Now, what I want you to understand is that the words of Jesus Christ are meant to change. It's meant to move. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, through the insincerity of liars whose consciousness, conscience, consciousness are seared. That is literally the idea that there's no feeling any longer in the conscience. 
In other words, the words of Jesus, they, they really don't move us anymore. I know what they say. It just doesn't really move me anymore. And so really what I'm saying is, listen, you know, I can listen to sermons. I can sit in on Bible classes from time to time. But you know what? I'm not really moved by anything anymore. Come on in. Come on in. Just don't touch anything. Don't touch anything. And so this morning, I would like to just spend a few short minutes going through our house and talking about the rooms that Jesus wishes to rearrange. As Jesus comes into our house, he is inevitably going to visit our guest room. He's going to go to our guest room and he's going to look to see what kind of visitors we have. In particular, our friends. Take your Bible and look at 2 Samuel chapter 13. In 2 Samuel chapter 13, look at verses 1 and 2. 2 Samuel 13, beginning in verse 1, it said, Some time passed, David's son Absalom had a beautiful sister named Tamar, and David's son Amnon was infatuated with her. Amnon was frustrated to the point of making himself sick over his sister Tamar because she was a virgin, but it seemed impossible to do anything to her. This man fell in love with his half-sister, but as he's contemplated this love that he has got for his sister, he thought, you know, I just don't know how I'm going to get around doing anything about it. How, how can I do something about this? Well, if you don't remember what he did, we're not going to take the time to read it. He raped her, is what he did. He raped her. But how did he get around to doing that? Look at the beginning of verse 3. Amnon had a friend named Jonadab. Amnon had a friend. And his friend had an idea. I'll tell you how to do it. This is how you do it. And what I want you to understand, especially our young people, is that many times you've heard the gospel message and you've been taught by your parents and your grandparents and you know that you should not do certain things and you think within yourself that, you know, it's really hard for me to imagine me doing those things. But I tell you how you're going to be able to do it. If you have a friend that will encourage you to do it. If you have a friend who will do it with you. Parents tell children all of the time to be careful who your friends are. Why? Why do we do that? Because many times you become what they are. Now that I'm a child of God, now that I'm a Christian, I've got to watch who my associates are in this life. Amos, in that little book of Amos, in chapter 3 and verse 3, he says, Do two walk together unless they have agreed to meet? Think about that. Do two walk together unless they have agreed to meet? How is it possible for me to be a friend with somebody if I don't enjoy the things that they enjoy or do the things that they do? How can I? I mean, if I'm a Christian and my friend is not a Christian and, and they keep wanting me to do things that are wrong, how can I continue to be their friend unless I do what they want to do? How can two walk together unless they agree? The Apostle Paul said, be not deceived, evil, com evil companions corrupt good morals. Now, I'm not saying that we cannot have friends that are not Christians. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is we have to be careful. If they start involving themselves in things that you know is wrong, run. Get away from them. When you become a Christian, there may be some friends that you just have to distance yourself from. It's not easy. But we have to. Why? Because you are now a child of God. You are a follower of Jesus. And I cannot do some of the things that my friends want me to do. Somebody says, now wait a minute, Kevin. 
That's kind of personal, don't you think? I like my friends. I enjoy my friends. I, I don't know if any of my friends are really any of your business, and I understand that. I hear what you're saying, but again, it comes, to, it comes down to come on in, just don't touch anything. Come on into my life, but just don't touch anything. I like my friends just the way they are, Lord. But after we get our, out of the guest room, I want you to understand that Jesus is probably at some time going to make his way over to the kitchen and dining area. And if the Lord, you know, I always think, if the Lord were to come to dinner tonight, would there be like those embarrassing or awkward moments as people look around trying to figure out what they're going to say or do next? Or would there be the embarrassment of sitting down and your children start eating before the prayer is said? You know, when people come to our house, would they see us giving thanks around the table? But really what I'm interested in is more than, than physical food and, and praying. I'm interested in our appetites. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. What kind of appetite do we have outside of this physical realm? What kind of appetite do we have? Would there be an appetite for the word of God if someone came to your home? Yeah, I remember, I, and I think I've shared this before, I remember when I would spend the night with my, with my grandmother. I remember waking up every single morning, every time I spent the night. I would wake up in the morning and I would go into the kitchen, I would sit down at the table while she was making breakfast. And I'll never forget, on every occasion, sitting there on the table was an open Bible. First thing she did was she would sit down at the table she would read her Bible, and then she would get up. When she would hear us get up, she would get up and start making breakfast. Do you have those type of appetites? Is it that important to you? Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up to salvation. Do we have any appetite in studying the Word of God? And I'm not just talking about on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. Do we have an appetite to study it at our homes? How about teaching others? In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, Paul writes to Timothy and he says, What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Have you cultivated an appetite to want to teach others? It's an appetite. It's a desire. Or do you put it off and expect somebody else to do the teaching? Kevin, listen, you're welcome, to, you're welcome into my kitchen and my dining room. Anytime you want, but just please don't touch anything. Don't touch anything. I like it just the way it is. Will you allow the Lord to be the Lord over your appetite? And then as we leave the dining room area, eventually the Lord's going to make his way over to our family room. And he will be able to see all kinds of things in our family room. In Judges chapter 17 and verse 5, we read where the man Micah had a house full of gods. And so do we. Many times they're found in the family room because it is there where I will find my entertainment. I'll find my television, my stereo, my computer. I'll find my books. And we live and we've become a 24-hour-a-day self-service pleasure and entertainment society. That's what we've become. And we have our lives ordered just the way we like it. I can watch anything at any time and I can view any image that I want in the privacy of my own home, and many do. And many of us, if we admit to it, have become slaves to the entertainment industry. And I'm not just talking about television either. We're so caught up in our television shows, or the latest entertainers, or Facebook, or Twitter, or TikTok, or whatever the case may be, and we have little time for sharing things about God. 
Now, any one of those things, any one of those things in and of themselves, there's nothing wrong with them. There's nothing wrong with them. But the way that we have them structured and the way we have them prior, prioritized in our life, we have very little room for God. You know, people pick up their phone all of the time. Even in worship service, people will pick up their phone and go to Facebook. They will go shopping. They will do many things on their phone. But how many times do they pick this up a day? Think about it. Where's our priority? I've got to look at my phone. Got to have my phone. Where's my phone? I got to, I got to pull it up. I got to see who posted what. I got to make sure. But this starts to get dust sitting on the shelf. Again, what are we looking at? David said one time in Psalm chapter 101 of verse 3, I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. I wonder if David would be talking about television if he lived in the 21st century or Facebook or Twitter or any of those things. I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. Job said in Job chapter 31 and verse 1, I have made a covenant with my eyes that I will not look lustfully after a woman. Be yet on our television shows and in our, uh, used to be magazines, but now it's just right there on the internet. And the music that we hear, these images are conjured up in our minds over and over and over again. And I've got news for you. With things like pornography, husbands, wives, that is a form of sexual abuse. It needs to stop. It's very easy to look at these things now. I will not set my eyes, I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. Why do we allow the filth why do we allow the, the, the foul language? Why do we allow, allow the immodest dress, the, the, the filthy song lyrics? Why do we allow that into our home? I, I remember there was a show that came on several years ago. And I didn't know what it was at first. It was brand new. And a Christian uh, who I knew very well posted on Facebook that they had their chips, they had their Mountain Dew, and they were getting ready to sit down and watch this show. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, and, and I had heard many people say it's such a great show. It had dragons and castles and all of these things. And so I got curious and I pulled up an episode. Well, that show was called Game of Thrones. And let me tell you, it was nothing, I, I, I turned it off, it, it was nothing but language and nudity. That's all it was. And a Christian posted that for the public to see. I'm sitting down to watch this show. I want you to understand that we cannot allow the sins that Jesus died for to become our <coughs> entertainment. We can't do that. And unfortunately, far too many times we've done that very thing. Does God want me to be unnecessarily exposed to people who mock him and mock his commandments and desensitize me and my family to sin? Even the most godly TV shows, even the most godly websites, the most godly of things that take our time away from prayer, meditation, and study, and teaching the word of God becomes sin in our life. Again, I hear what you're saying. I accept Jesus into my life. I want to accept Jesus into my life, but just don't touch anything. Leave me alone. I'm happy the way I am. But then finally, the Lord is going to look in our closet. 
And if he looks in our closet, what is he going to find? What kind of clothing? Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9. Also, the women are to dress themselves in modest clothing, with decency and good sense, not with elaborate hairstyles, gold, pearls, or expensive apparel, but with good works, as is proper for women who profess to worship God. And then if you turn to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. In the same way, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that even if some disobey the word, they may be won over, without a word by the way their wives live. When they observe your pure, reverent lives, don't let your beauty consist of outward things like elaborate hairstyles and wearing gold, jewelry, or fine clothes, but rather what is inside the heart, the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For in the past, the holy women who put their hope in God also adorn themselves in this way, submitting to their own husbands. You know, again, I hear you, but really my clothes don't say anything about me. I've heard that before. They don't say anything about what I have in my mind. This is where the old saying comes in. When somebody tells me that their clothing doesn't say what they have on their mind. This is where, you know, we've heard it. I was born at night, but not last night kind of thing. It's ridiculous. A spokeswoman for a well-known fashion apparel company who's in this business, when talking about and promoting the latest summer fashion, said this, come on, ladies, and let him know what you have on your mind. You see, our clothes do send a message. And it amazes me. And and men are just as guilty. Uh, Let's be honest. I'm not just talking about women here. Men Men are just as guilty as being immodest. But it amazes me when I see women who wear the shortest of shorts or the shortest of dresses or, or they've got these extremely tight tops on that reveal everything that they have and, and they act insulted. They act like they're insulted by the looks and the comments that make that men make toward them. I hear women all of the time saying, you know, it doesn't matter what I wear. It doesn't matter what I wear at all. I could have on baggy pants and a baggy shirt and there'll still be men looking at me. Well, I understand that. And, and that's true. That, that's very true. But you know what that tells me? That tells me that if you know men will look regardless of what you're wearing and you still choose to wear revealing outfits, that tells me that you don't really care. Look, Kevin, it's my body, and I'll put on it whatever I want. I'll wear whatever I want. You're going too far. I've heard it before. And again, it's like this. Come on into my life, Jesus. I accept you into my life. Just don't touch anything. Don't touch anything. Jesus asked one time in Luke chapter 6 and verse 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? As I said at the beginning, Jesus did not come to this low ground to die and save me in whatever life I want to live. It's not what he did. He came that I might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus knocks on my front door to come into my home. Not so that he can stand there and see the way I live, but to rearrange my home, that I might become great in his sight and live with him forever. Who this morning would invite the Lord to come in and allow him to make the changes that he wishes to make? Do any of us have that attitude? Come on in, Jesus. Just don't touch anything. I like where I'm at right now. Or who would say to the Lord, Lord, welcome to my house. It's so good to have you come on in and change me. What do I need to do to rearrange my life 
so that I can live with you in heaven. If you've not yet rendered obedience to the gospel of Christ, again, that is the most important decision that you will ever make in your life. Not your spouse, not whether to have kids or not, not what job to have. Your salvation is the biggest decision that you will ever make. And if you've not yet been baptized into Christ, the question is, why not? Do you have questions? Ask those questions. Because you're not guaranteed another day. And those of us who are Christians, maybe in this lesson, you're one of those people that, that know that you want Jesus in your life, but you don't want him to change anything. Well, I got news for you. That's what he's meant to do. Is change your life. Make the corrections you need to make. Let Jesus lead you to heaven. We ask that you, if you have a need, we ask that you make it known right now as together we stand and sing the invitation song.